The foods we enjoy every day are sometimes hard to find. In Colombia, workers toil away at rustic mills to make panela, a type of unrefined raw sugar. In Brazil, farmers risk their lives climbing thin palm trees deep in the Amazon rainforest to harvest berries that later become $15 acai bowls. And in Nepal, people hang from cliffs to harvest a rare kind of honey. We traveled across the world to see how far people go to put food on our table. Our journey starts in a village in Colombia where Antonio uses traditional techniques to make panela sugar, which can cost 20 times more than white sugar in the US. Panela is beloved in Colombia, where it's commonly consumed in place of processed white sugar. But this sweet nectar doesn't come cheap. In the US, it can cost 20 times more than white sugar. And in Colombia, depending on where it's made, panela can cost up to 17,000 pesos per kilogram. The purest form of panela is made by the indigenous communities of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, the highest coastal mountain range in the world. Here, long distances, high temperatures, and limited resources make panela much more valuable than any other type of sugar. So, how is wild panela made? And is this what makes it so expensive? La panela pues está hecha de puro la guarda de la caña y pues con eso es que nos tomamos y eso hace que nos, nuestro cuerpo eh, dé mucho más energía. Digamos que nos endulzamos. This is Antonio. He's a kogi one of the four indigenous communities of the Sierra Nevada. To make panela, Antonio uses a sugar mill made out of wood. El trapiche está construido de, de unos palos que es fino nada más eh, para eso. Ese palo, algo se llama nemacula. Using this mill is hard work. It takes three people to keep it running. Two push the cane into the mill, while another one directs the mule that powers it. In all cases, everything is difficult. We have to be careful of what we are doing, because many times the trapiche has done damage for the damage. For the damage, we are putting the cane there, and for the damage, we can put the hand and hurt with the hand, and that is very dangerous. The trapiche is made of wood, In order to extract sugar from the cane juice, Antonio and the others boil it along with water. It took Antonio and the others two hours to extract enough sugar cane juice to fill this pot. He uses dried sugar cane to fuel the fire. Después de echarle ahí, toca esperar que se que se calienta y todas las de toda la suciedad, eh, todos los que contienen o sea, sucio. Se a montar arriba para poder recogerla. The juice boils quickly and at very high temperatures, so hot that some of the sugar caramelizes. During the boiling process, the juice is constantly stirred and pushed to the bottom of the pot where the temperature is higher. Antonio then removes the water, revealing the sugar at the bottom of the pot. At this stage, when the sugar has a thick, gooey texture, it is called honey. Pues es muy dulce, delicioso, sabe. Además es un poco gelatinoso y chicloso. Y pues se siente como exquisito. Antonio scrapes it off and pours it into these molds where it will rest for a few hours and become panela. Milling sugarcane and boiling its juice like this preserves the molasses naturally present in the sugarcane, which is usually removed in refined white sugar 
or removed and added back in in brown sugar. The molasses gives the panela a more complex caramel flavor and makes it richer in minerals and vitamins. But this can only happen if the weather is right. Today, the weather is a bit too hot, so the honey needs to be bottled and transported to another village at a higher altitude to harden correctly. When the panela is dry, it is sold in one kilogram portions like this one. With 10 buckets of sugarcane, Antonio can get 12 panelas. Pues la panela es tradicional desde siempre. Eso pues aprendemos desde la infancia. Digamos que pues vemos nuestro padre cuando nacemos eh, mirándolo pues eh, moliendo la caña y pues uno colabora. Digamos que a seguir atrás al mulo para que le pueda echarle y pues así aprendemos y ya but it's not just the process that makes panela different from other types of sugar. It's the sugar cane it comes from. Por eso aquí en la Sierra Nevada, habemos cuatro étnicos, lo que lo que consumimos la panela. Pasa que hoy hay hay cuatro clases de caña. Caña PJ, y cubana, y caña blanca y caña dulce. Agustin has lived here for the last 12 years. He's a local guide, connecting visitors to the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta with his native gorgi traditions. Y no se puede cortar así como cuando así. Tiene que limpiárselo así. Hay que limpiar. ¿Por qué? Para que se haga limpio en la carne. Y ya está aquí cortado. Que esto hay que dejarlo para la próxima. Esto. Pues no puede cortar todo. Esto. No, hay que dejar siempre uno como cinco carne así, como este tamaño. White sugar cane is native to this area of the Sierra Nevada and is what the corgi community uses for its panela. As he harvests, Agustin also selects the best seeds to make new plants. This is for sembrar. This is what I do. This is for seed. This is for plant. This is for seed. This is for seed. I cut it like this. One, two, three, four. I have it here, until here. I cut it like three pieces. I plant it so that it grows. It takes a whole year for sugarcane to grow, and it heavily depends on the weather. While farmed varieties can rely on a constant supply of water, the sugarcane here in the Sierra Nevada relies on rivers, rainfall, and meltwater from ice caps, making them high in fiber but low in sugar. Farmed varieties, on the other hand, yield more sugar, but are low in fiber. The sugarcane here is also very fragile, and proximity to other plants may kill it. If I mark with the coca, with the tobacco, if I cut the cane, it starts to break, or comes the gusano or comes the hay. Yes, because tobacco is very, very dangerous with this, with this mat. When he's finished, Agustin will walk to Antonio's mill, where sugarcane will be turned into honey, and then panela, all over again. A medida que se nos, se nos acabe la panela, volvamos a moler. Digamos que si sale cuatro baldes, llega nada más por la mitad de, de una botella que es grande. Y pues si hay, habemos bastante familia, pues se acaba rápido. Both the dry panela and the gooey honey are an essential part of the corgi diet. They are used in drinks like agua panela, an infusion of panela in hot water, but are also consumed on special occasions, like marriages and baptisms. Panela has an advantage over honey. It can be stored for longer, and it can be sold. More recently, and only to those who ask, the community has started selling it. But the moment that panela leaves the sugar mill, its price rises. This is the main road in this part of the Sierra. For panela producers to find buyers, 
they have to walk to the closest village, and that can take hours. Viene diferente lugares, distancia una de diez horas, de seis horas, de una hora, así. Se no vive así una cercano. The nearest village to Agustin and Antonio is two hours away on foot. Para nosotros hay bajo precio. O sea, 10 panelas está o 20 panelas está 25 mil pesos. Y de acá afuera está 100 mil pesos por la caja. In town, this panela can cost up to 17,000 pesos per kilogram. That's more than four times the price of panela made from farmed sugar cane. But these high prices are exactly what the community wants. In the last few years, the indigenous communities of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta have worked hard to market their product fairly and invest in better infrastructure. The Arhuaco, another one of these four communities, has partnered with the UN and Ecopetrol, a major gas company, to modernize its sugar mills and get a license to sell wild panela abroad. The global rise in fame of panela as a healthy alternative to sugar is also contributing to increased demand. Panela made from farmed sugar canes has reached over $36 per kilogram, while indigenous varieties aren't yet exported. But there is a difference between what is currently available to consumers and the indigenous panela. Colombia is one of the world's top sugarcane producers, producing 2.3 million metric tons of sugarcane annually. Most sugarcane is farmed in giant monoculture plantations and needs excessive amounts of water to survive. According to the UN, sugarcane requires more water than any other crop to reach maturity, more than soy and maize. In the last decade, sugarcane has also been used to make ethanol, which is considered an important biofuel. This has ramped up sugarcane monocultures even more, and sugarcane crops now take up to 60 million acres of land worldwide. The overabundance of panela made from farmed sugarcane diminishes the competitiveness of the wild panela in the market, like the one Antonio and Agustin use here in the Sierra Nevada. But the isolation of the mountains makes keeping panela alive here challenging. In the last few years, snow has almost disappeared from some peaks in the Sierra Nevada. This means no meltwater in the summer, a crucial resource for sugarcane. The warming climate is also making it hard for panela to dry fully and more and more families are either skipping the drying step and just making honey, which is more perishable and harder to sell, or they're moving their sugarcane mills to higher, even more remote mountain slopes. Next, we visit the Philippines, where for centuries an indigenous tribe has been hunting for rare birds' nests that are used in a traditional soup. Alvin and his crew gather at Bangalan Point on Mighty Git Island. His group consists of relatives, cousins, brothers, uncles, and nephews. They pack the boat with essential tools. Blue bead, flashlight, buho na gagamitin na panongkit. And they're heading to Nabat Island. It's one of the 7,000 islands that make up the Philippines, and it can only be reached by boat. They get off the boat and walk barefoot across the slippery and sharp rocks. They make the ladder as they're climbing up. They tighten the bamboo with rope. Then they attach a piece of wood called kalitang to the ladder. 
yung pinakamahirap gawin talaga dyan, yung pag-akyat. Siyempre, hindi mo pa alam kung maganda yung pagkasabit ng kalitang. Ba, sinabit. Tapos, hindi mo, hindi sure kung anong pagkalagay nun doon. Kaya medyo sa pag-akyat mo, medyo alanganin ka pa, baka biglang matanggal. The stakes are high. Tingin namin sa mga tao sa baba na mga kasama namin, parang mga bata na lang. Tinitignan ko yung, ano na, sabi ko, kunting pagkakamali lang talaga. Pag nalaglag, puro bato yung mababagsakan mo. Pag hindi na sa kondisyon yung katawan, huwag natin piliting umakyat kasi siyempre buhay natin yung nakataya dyan. But advanced bushadors like him sometimes use little to no support. Only their hands and feet. This is the most dangerous way to climb. In the regional language, it's known as kagang kagang lang, or like a crab. Kasi may mga bato na pag hinawa ka mo, bigla na lang bumabagsak. Alvin has had some close calls, and he dislocated his shoulder once. Pag akyat ko sa butas, medyo maliit yung butas. Nung daan-daan akong bumaba sa kawayan, isang kami na lang inawak ko sa kawayan. Yun na, uminto na talaga ako sa pag-akyat ng, ano, ng, sa mga matataas pa. Nabata Island is completely remote. If there's an emergency, there's no way to quickly get help. Ang dami na rin na disgrasya na sa pag-akyat. Bayaw ko na isa na nalaglag, patay din. The bushadors only harvest during the day when the birds are out finding food. Sometimes the caves are lower and easier to reach. But the waves crashing against the cliffs present a threat. Yeah. The entrances are small, but the caves are usually spacious. They use flashlights to light the path. After spotting the nests, Alvin uses a spray bottle filled with water to loosen them. They are then gently peeled away from the cave walls. Yung ibo nun, sa pag walong piraso yung pugad, ibig sabihin yung ibo niya ay 16. Si partner lagi yan, isang pugad, dalawang ibo ka sa kagad yan. Magpartner kagad yan yung, yung isang pugad. Siguro naman mayroon katulad din ng tao pag <laughs> may poor ibo. <laughs> The birds like the caves because no nang ibang hayop kasi nasa loob ng kuiba wala na ring ibang hayop na pwedeng pumasok makakapasok doon eh. Alvin and his group are also careful not to pick any nests with eggs. He knows that if the bird survives, so will his livelihood. Yun ang pinagkakakita ng isang busyador balin sa sayaw. Sometimes the nests are hard to reach. Pwede mo siyang magamit yung tinidor kasi kitali mo siya sa dulo ng buho. Yun ang gagamitin mong panungkit ng pugad. The bird makes a new nest in 15 days when the old one's gone. But sometimes all that hard work the bushadors put in is for nothing if the haul is no good. Baka nang nakakapanghina ng katawan na maliliit pa. Alvin and his relatives are the only people who harvest on Nabat Island. That's because his ancestors discovered the caves hundreds of years ago. Pamilya na namin yung nag... Uh, nag nangungwa dito hanggang sa ngayon. Nandito pa rin kami. Siguro may mga susunod, susunod naman sa amin. Pagtapos na kami, hindi na kayang umakyat. May susunod na naman ang mga bata na yung mga walang planong mag-aral. Alvin himself was only nine years old when he went to the caves for the first time with his father, who was also a bushador. They spend the night on the island, but even then they're on high alert. May mga sindikato, may mga baril, baka mga baril kami. Swiftlet nests are only harvested from December to April, and Alvin can find as many as 2,500 in those five months. After harvesting, the bushadors clean them to remove any feathers or branches. Then they divide them by their hardness and color. Class A nests are the most profitable. They're typically white, dry, and made of pure saliva. Class B nests are not as white and may have some debris mixed in. And Class C nests are soft and yellow. Just two pounds of the best kind are worth about $2,900. May madala lang na para may kapuha sila na 
the local city hall buys the nests from the bouchadors at a regulated price and sells them to private customers around the world. The bouchadors split the profits. Alvin makes about $600 once the season is complete. It isn't a lot of money, but he says it's enough. The nests are made from the hardened saliva of the swiftlet bird. They are the main ingredient in bird's nest soup, a delicacy in China and around the world. A bowl can cost as much as $100. setingin ko yung kumakain lang ng soup ng balin sa sayo, yung mga mayayaman lang talaga. Yung mga katulad natin, medyo parang wala na lang. But today, Alvin gave in and tried some. <laughs> in recent years, demand for the nests and bird's nest soup has gone up. The industry is worth $5 billion. And many Southeast Asian countries have turned to swiftlet farming. They've set up structures that mimic the bird's natural habitat. Dark, abandoned buildings that feel like caves. And they use fake bird calls to attract the swiftlets. Bouchardors say they've noticed a difference in the number of swiftlet nests left in the wild. But they're not sure if it's because of farming or other environmental factors. The farms do pose a challenge to the bouchardors' livelihood. But Alvin says cave nests are higher quality than farmed ones. Locals believe they have medicinal properties. And there's some science that backs it up. A 2015 study shows the nests are loaded with nutrients that can boost a child's immunity. And they're rich in proteins, amino acids, and vitamins that strengthen organs. Alvin is finally home after two days of hunting for nests. The season is almost over. Kailangan ko ng pagiging isang busyador. Yun na lang eh, kasi hindi naman ako nakapag-aaral, hindi ako nakapagtapos ng pag-aaral. Tapos, unang-una, ayaw ko rin magtrabaho na malayo sa pamilya ko kasi mas, ano na eh, kumikita na rin ako dito sa pagiging busyador. Magdala lang kayo na ang salita niya. For the rest of the year, he earns a living by fishing. His wife, Marby, is relieved. For Alvin, climbing the same caves his ancestors did is a great honor. Now he takes pride in carrying on the tradition. May isang negosyante talaga na gustong kunin ito yung isla. Gagawin niya ang resort na ipinaglaban ko talaga na ano na hindi niya pwedeng kunin kasi yun nga sa amin ito eh. Galing pa sa mga anino namin. Now we head to Sri Lanka where Shahan climbs dozens of trees to grab coconuts but still makes less than $5 a day. Coconuts have been a staple food in Sri Lanka for millennia. Today, it's one of the biggest producers in the world, growing roughly two and a half million metric tons a year. But farmers face challenges to keep up with this pace. For one, trees take a while to grow, sometimes more than six years before they produce any coconuts. They can live up to a century, growing fruit every month and a half during their lifetime. To make sure they're constantly harvesting ripe fruit, farmers manage massive forests in rotation. Harvesting a new area every day means farmers can also inspect the palms for any pest infestation. White flies and Asian rhinoceros beetles are coconut palms' biggest enemies. These giant beetles burrow into the core and eat the nutrients. If a tree is too far gone, farmers have to burn and remove it to prevent the beetles from spreading. Farmers carry their picking tools as they head out to harvest. The 
That stick is one way to reach the coconuts without putting anyone at risk. But often, the only way to get the fruit is to climb. Shahan started scaling palms four years ago. With only his hands and feet, he shimmies up the tree. It takes him only two to three minutes to reach the top. Now, he's 80 feet up with no rope to protect him. Shahan says he's never fallen, but a fall from this height could be deadly. He knows which coconuts are ready when he hears water sloshing around inside. He'll repeat this daunting climb on dozens of trees today. One tree yields up to 80 coconuts a year. Farmers gather them up for sorting and drying. The drier the coconut, the easier it is to peel off the inedible outer husk. Farmers earn under $5 a day, which is less than the average salary in the country. To bridge the gap, Navic Mills told us it covers the school fees for the farmer's children. They load the coconuts on trucks bound for Navic Mills' factory just up the road. This is the second sorting stage. Imports for coconut oil have surged across the West. So to keep pace, the company introduced these saws. They doubled the speed at which they could remove the fibrous coconut shells. But workers have to be careful. Flying pieces of coconut shells have nicked workers' eyes before. In the main room, workers still peel the coconuts by hand. But peeling knives are no less dangerous. Ashoka Kumari peels about 2,500 coconuts in a shift. Making less than one cent a coconut, Ashoka usually walks away with just under $10 a day. Just like farmers, it's less than an average salary in Sri Lanka. A team of inspectors comes through to check the quality. If they see any impurities, they'll pull those bad coconuts out. Meanwhile, another peeler slices open the fruit and dumps out the water. From this point on, machines will do the bulk of the work. Because of their high fat content, peeled coconuts spoil fast, so the company has to process them quickly. Only 12 hours we can keep it. Otherwise, we have to uh, waste the product. The company produces over a dozen coconut products, from ice cream and water to desiccated coconut and curry-infused milks. But oil and regular coconut milk are the company's best sellers. These machines press virgin coconut oil out of chunks and pump it into glass bottles. This line is making milk. Machines grate the meat into small flakes extract the milk, and dispense it into cans. At this point, workers hop back into the process to inspect the sealed cans and move the racks into sterilizing machines. In Sri Lanka, coconut palms are known as the tree of life. They can feed a family of five for a century. 
and they're so important it's illegal to cut one down before it matures. Coconuts make up roughly 15% of the calories Sri Lankans consume and earn the country over $800 million every year. The story of coconuts in Sri Lanka goes back thousands of years. It's said they originate from the Western Pacific, but floated to the Pacific Islands in India on ocean currents. People here long cherish coconuts because one fruit packs so much power. It has water, fiber to make rope, calorie-rich meat, oil, and a hard shell ideal for crafts. It also had religious importance and was presented as an offering to Hindu gods. In the 16th century, merchants brought coconuts to the global stage. Spanish and Portuguese explorers coined the term coconut from their slang word for head because of the fruit's resemblance to a face. They spread the fruit across Africa and South America. In the early 1900s, bakers in the U.S. and the U.K. started using desiccated coconut in their sweets. In the 2010s, Western countries co-opted coconuts as the newest superfood. Health gurus and wellness experts are looking beyond traditional American foods for things that are nutrient-dense. Companies and wellness influencers claimed the fruit could improve bone health and blood sugar, promote weight loss, and help slow Alzheimer's thanks to its antioxidants. Yeah, folks are so into it because there's some big health claim attached to it. And manufacturers were quick to capitalize. Soon, coconut products weighed down shelves in health food stores across the U.S. and Europe. Its water replaced Gatorade as a post-workout drink and its pulp was turned into healthy ice cream. And coconut oil became a popular swap for other cooking oils because it has no cholesterol. But nutritionists say the promises the coconut craze was built upon aren't so straightforward. So now all of a sudden it means that coconut oil has some magical power, therefore we must all use it. When that's not actually the case, because we don't have the research. It's interesting when you look at food databases, it's usually foods that everybody's familiar with. Foods that are outside of the quote-unquote dominant norm are often not as well researched. Coconut water does have lots of electrolytes and can be a natural replacement for sports drinks. It makes sense. All of the places that coconuts grow are tropical climates. It's hot, people sweat a lot, so it's naturally, you know, hydrating for those folks. But when it's over-processed or packed full of sugar, that benefit goes away. And coconut oil is also really fatty. 87% saturated fat to be exact, much higher than butter, and it has more calories too. In 2017, the American Heart Association issued an advisory on saturated fats, warning coconut oil could increase bad cholesterol and cause cardiovascular events. Yeah, if you're eating large amounts of coconut oil out of the blue, your body will let you know that it may or may not like it. But Maya said that doesn't mean coconut oil has to be villainized. There are some nutrients in coconuts that are really beneficial. You're gonna get some vitamin C, some potassium, some fiber. Remember, it has been used in cuisines around the world for thousands of years. It's just a matter of how you eat it. What I would rather is that people are varying their oils and if the cooking application warrants coconut oil, that they use it. I think it's completely fine to eat them I, you know, if it's culturally relevant, go for it. Even if it's not and you want to try it, go for it. What I do say to people is don't expect a miracle cure from it. But all this health confusion hasn't stopped consumers from gulping down coconuts, allowing Sri Lanka to take its business well beyond its shores. While the country still eats roughly 75% of its own coconut production, big companies like this one have popped up solely to export the product. In just five years, Navic Mills has become one of the biggest coconut processors in Sri Lanka. Altogether, Navic Mills processes 30,000 metric tons of coconuts, and 95% of it ends up abroad, mostly in European and North American countries. And the company has gone to incredible lengths to keep up with surging demand. It had to plant 20,000 more trees and hire dozens of new workers. Rebuilt a new plant, so expanding uh, production line and fixing new machine. But coconut farmers aren't the only superfood producers feeling this squeeze. Foods that originate outside of the U.S. 
there was a massive peak in interest in the last 10 to 15 years. There was a time when that was not a thing. In the Brazilian Amazon, farmers risk their lives to scale thin trees for acai. The berries have been a staple food here for centuries. But in the last decade, they've gained global fame, praised for their antioxidants and blended into a valuable frozen pulp. While an acai smoothie bowl can go for $15 in New York City, Brazilian farmers make as little as 20 cents a pound for the raw berries. In Peru, producers of quinoa have nearly tripled production to keep up with demand from consumers in the U.S. and Europe. Soon, French and British farmers started growing quinoa themselves to grab a share of the profit. They flooded the market with too much supply and sent Peruvian prices plunging in 2015. In Mexico, avocado farmers have formed vigilante groups to fight off cartels gunning for their valuable crops. Avocado prices jumped 129% in a decade when it became a favorite for millennials. I'm always wary of the next miracle food. Because just like coconut, nutritionists are split on if these superfoods are actually as powerful as the marketing suggests. There is a particular way that we talk about wellness in the U.S., and it's really from this Anglo-American, Anglo-European perspective. And we don't know how to quantify or categorize things that fit outside of dominant wellness culture. What's left out is the historical and cultural context of superfoods and the acknowledgement of the people left to bear the brunt of our health food obsessions. On the end of every single thing that we put into our mouth is someone who's worked tirelessly to get it there. Our next stop is Mexico, where most of America's limes come from, but farmers there are struggling to keep up production as they battle extreme weather. About 45 lime producers are spread across Martinez de la Torre, Veracruz. They grow Persian limes, the seedless kind. Persian limes love the wet climate here. But in recent years, the area has faced increasingly extreme weather. So how then do they grow strong enough lime trees even without seeds? Well, believe it or not, they start with orange seeds. They take a mature orange stalk and a bud from a lime plant and use a grafting technique to combine them. Literalmente se pega esa yema a la planta, se hace una venda con un nylon. While it grows, workers cut away any leaves that aren't lime, basically convincing this orange plant that it's a lime one. Orange rootstocks like this are hardier, so when it's mature, the fusion lime plant will better stand up to diseases and climate change. After about a year, esta planta ya está lista para salir a campo y ser sembrada. Y cuando ya tiene a partir de dos, o en este caso ya tres ramitas, ya está. But the hard work doesn't stop there. Yo considero que son las plagas y las enfermedades que es lo que tenemos que estar este constantemente monitoreando. In 2014, lime farms across Mexico saw a huge drop in production because of a plant killing disease called HLB or citrus greening. Insects transmit a type of bacteria that starves the trees of nutrients, causing it to produce less fruit. So how did they keep producing millions of limes with these insects on the loose? Well, teams here discovered they could control HLB and a disease called woodpocket using mesh netting and insecticide. Puede ser ya rápidamente se monitorear todas las plantas, asegurarnos que hay presencia como tal en la planta y realizar aplicaciones. Pues es de suma importancia porque ahora sí esto es lo que nos garantiza tener una planta segura al momento de llevarla al campo. It takes about four years for the tree to bear fruit. One tree can produce about 150 pounds of limes per year. This picker has been harvesting here for two years. Like him, most everyone working on the farm is from the state. But in the last five years, limes haven't always looked like this. Veracruz farmers have faced a growing number of floods, freezes, and high winds. La planta de limón es muy sensible al tema del, del clima. In very dry conditions, the lime skin is too smooth and may turn yellow. If conditions are too wet, the tree will drown, 
causing the fruit's peel to split. When it's really windy, branches hit the fruit. Le hacen como una herida y después esa herida cicatriza formando estas lacras. This extreme weather was part of what caused a lime shortage that began in 2021, driving prices up 300% by January 2022. Es un cultivo muy muy sensible, el cual este nos requiere mucha atención, sí, constantemente, y eso implica hacer ajustes en el plan de trabajo agronómico de acuerdo a a ciertos eh, fenómenos que pudieran llegarse a presentar. Still, Veracruz has been spared the worst of these shifting weather patterns. Farmers here hope that grafting will be their tree's lifeline if that time does come. In the fields, workers tug off ripe limes and drop them into these traditional ayate bags, woven from agave leaves. Workers can harvest about 2,000 limes in a day. They load them onto trucks headed to the packaging facility. Empezamos nuestro proceso con el área de vaciado. This machine dumps limes onto the processing line. Each one gets washed with a detergent disinfectant. Ah, para retirar cualquier tipo de suciedad, polvo que pueda traer de campo a la fruta. And hit with a spray of palm wax. It's not just to make the limes look shiny. La fruta es para este, poner como una capa sobre la fruta que le va a ayudar a su vida de anaquel que la fruta tenga una, una mayor vida, pues que no se deshidrate y que no se madure tan pronto. Throughout their journey in the factory, the limes will get sorted multiple times. Some stations do it by hand, others with fancy tech. Este, nuestra máquina consta de un sistema operativo el cual toma de 20 a 40 fotos este, a cada fruta que va pasando. Using those pictures, the machines separated them based on their size. Ones that aren't the right size will go directly to Mexico's juicing industry. The perfectly sized ones will head on to get exported. But first, there's quality control. Este limón es para exportación de Estados Unidos. Tenemos un limón con una, una buena cáscara, un buen color, un color uniforme. Y si lo partimos o lo abrimos, tenemos una buena cantidad de jugo. After they pass this final test, the limes are ready for packaging and shipping. The majority of the limes produced in this region end up in the United States. Demand for limes has been increasing for decades, as Latin American and Asian cuisines became more popular. But in 1994, after a new free trade agreement went into effect, the floodgates for Mexican limes opened. Now, the U.S. is the biggest importer of limes globally, doubling the amount it purchased from Mexico in the last 10 years. To keep up with demand, Mexico increased its production 50% in the same decade. Workers here say that demand is a double-edged sword. On one hand, El limón es el sustento de miles de hogares, de muchas personas, de muchas empresas y de importación, de exportación de materias primas, fertilizantes. Entonces, esto da comida a muchísima gente. But the downside, extreme weather is making it hard to keep up. Cada vez hay calores más fuertes y se nota cada vez más la falta de lluvia. The farm can also lean on that grafting technique to help grow trees faster, so they can keep up with booming U.S. interest. But while they wait for what might come, they'll keep picking away, hoping for steady weather and a strong harvest. Sí, porque esto nos da muchísimo trabajo a, a todos nosotros, y la verdad nos sentimos muy orgullosos de que ustedes consuman el limón veracruzano y el limón mexicano. We travel to the mountains of Nepal, where hunters search for hallucinogenic honey that can cost $300 a bottle. The village of Sildunga sits about 6,000 feet above sea level. 64 families live here, and they're all involved in the hunt for honey. Everyone comes together the day before for the Maruni dance, which celebrates good over evil. The next day, Man, the village's main honey hunter, gets the handmade bamboo ladder ready. Yeah. 
They keep essentials to the minimum, ropes, buckets, and gear to protect against bee stings. They're heading to Tarebhir, a cliff where they've hunted for thousands of years. It's a three-hour drive. The village elder leads the commencement ritual. At the bottom of the cliff, they start a fire to smoke out the bees. At the top, another group assembles the ladder. Then they tie it to a tree and slowly move it down the cliff. Man climbs down the ladder barefoot for the best grip. He's about 80 stories above ground. But for safety, Man ties himself to the ladder by a rope. That's his only harness. As the bees swarm around him, he puts his hands in his pocket to protect them from stings. He still remembers the time when he was attacked by bees three years ago. The stings are painful, and to avoid fainting, Man rubs honey into his hands. But he's trading one risk for another, because the honey makes his hands slippery. Still, it has been 30 years since a honey hunter died on the job. Man uses his 12-foot long stick called a tango to cut the honeycomb. <laughs> Finally, he breaks off the comb. 800 feet below, a plastic sheet catches it. They collected eight combs, leaving behind 36 others. The next day, hunters head back to the village and start extracting the honey. Man says it's more abundant, stronger and sweeter in the spring. The smaller combs usually have the most, about 500 ounces. Locals celebrate the hunter's safe return in a tradition called shosho. It's meant to settle any nerves the men had during the hunt. These customs have been passed down for generations in Nepal, where people have been using this honey as a natural medicine since 1300 BC. They believe that it cures respiratory issues and that it works as an antiseptic and an aphrodisiac. 
While scientists are still researching the effects of mad honey, global demand has exploded in recent years. And that has led to over-harvesting, with foreign groups coming in to hunt for their own honey in the Gurung's land. So the Gurungs found a solution to regain control. And there's a reason why it's home to the very uncommon mad honey. The largest honeybee species in the world, measuring up to 1.2 inches, lives here. The Apis laboriosa nest in altitudes ranging from 3,000 to 10,000 feet above sea level. And they feed on a specific type of rhododendron that has a neurotoxin in its nectar. That's what triggers hallucinations. But climate change is causing the flowers to bloom unpredictably. The bee population is also shrinking because of natural disasters like wildfires, heavier rainfall, and extreme temperature changes. This all means less honey. In 2022, the village harvested about four gallons of honey, compared to about 40 gallons in 2017. Half of the honey is distributed evenly to every single villager. The rest goes to markets in Nepal. Other cliffs across the Himalayas and Turkey also have mad honey. And it sells online for hundreds of dollars. But this village makes only $1,800 on average every year from honey sales. So it's not really about the money. Most people here rely on farming for a steady income, like Mun's father. <laughs> but he participates in all of the hunting traditions like every villager. Man began hunting in his early 40s, when the Gurungs believe a man is in the prime of his life. Before that, he worked construction jobs in Malaysia. In fact, 56% of Nepali families have at least one person working and living abroad because of the lack of jobs in the country. They send home more than $8 billion a year in remittances. Man's son is also a construction worker. But Man hopes he will come home soon to carry on the tradition of honey hunting. Our last stop is Brazil, where workers harvest acai berries, a superfood that's trending across the world. To this day, most acai in Brazil is harvested by families on small-scale farms. But big plantations are on the rise, putting pressure on families like Lucas Nogueira's in a way of life that goes back generations. Mas é uma dávida de Deus. Uma importância muito grande para nós, para nossa alimentação, para nossa sobrevivência. So how did this Amazonian fruit become so trendy? And what is the true cost for the people who have been harvesting it for generations? Vem, vem junto. Aqui tem um cacho, aqui. Olha aqui, açaí. Olha aqui, açaí, ó. We met Lucas at the end of the 2021 harvest, but there were still some berries left on a few trees. His family's farm is roughly 70 miles from Belang, the capital of the state of Pará, which grows more than 90% of the acai produced in Brazil. The only tool they use to climb is a single piece of rope called a piconha. They used to be made of leaves. Essa folha aqui, a gente pegava Tossia ela, aí passava por aqui, fazia isso. 
para ver como, como o tempo vai mudando, né? Today, Lucas' son Luis Fernando will go up. Se tiver só pônei que tiver maduro, não tá que tiver paró. Pode subir, vai com cuidado. The trunks are so thin that climbers have to be lightweight. É perigoso sim. O cara tá lá em cima e o mar vai quebrar. É riscado o cara quebrar o braço, quebrar a pé. At the top, they swing from the tree to reach multiple bunches. Going down can be dangerous too, especially while carrying a large knife and holding an armful of branches. Dropping them could damage the fragile fruit. Graças a Deus eu nunca caí dessa zera. Quero que isso não aconteça comigo. Eu já caí três vezes dessa zera. Não me bati nenhuma vez, graças a Deus. And the risks don't end at the climb. Exclusivamente a gente anda é, nesses, nessas áreas. Tem muitos animais, né? Que nem cobra. Lucas and his family harvested 53 baskets like these in 2021, earning them an income of about $950. That's as little as 20 cents per pound. Meanwhile, a pound of processed acai sorbet can sell for $7 or more in the U.S. Part of the issue is that Lucas has to sell his acai as soon as possible because the fruit goes bad fast. That leaves farmers who don't have processing machines with little leverage to negotiate. Não tem empresa aqui na nossa comunidade. A gente vende para atravessador, para poder chegar na mão daquelas pessoas que vão beneficiar, que vão se dar bem. Merchants bring the acai to Belang by boat. It's a race against the clock to sell the fruit before it spoils, so markets run overnight. O acai apanhado hoje, ele dura em máximo 48 horas. 72 é assim, extrapolando. The price of the baskets varies every day, depending on the demand. Hoje, em média, um planeiro desse que está custando, hoje, 60. Most of the acai produced in the state stays in Brazil, but exports have skyrocketed, growing about 14,000 percent between 2011 and 2020. Você sabia que uma tigela de acai nos Estados Unidos custa 80 reais, 15 dólares. Quanto? 15 dólares. 15 dólares? Não sabia não. Some acai gets transported to processing facilities like North Acai. Every day, 22 tons of fruit are turned into frozen pulp, the acai that most people outside of Pará are familiar with. O acai é uma peliculazinha com caroço. Então, 95% do acai é caroço. This is the stage where we see the biggest jump in price, about 177%. Esse produto tem que estar congelado em menos de 24 horas. Aí a gente vem para cá. Aonde aqui é o túnel de congelamento. Opa, fica congelada nesses monoblocos, aonde a gente depois leva para a câmara de estocagem e guarda ele para vender ele no mercado internacional e nacional. Today, more than 70% of Brazil's açaí exports end up in the states. Nós estamos muito presente, muito forte, tá? Na região da Flórida, região de Nova York, região de Nova Jersey, aquela costa leste americana De norte a sul, nós estamos bem, bem, bem presentes. The global market for acai is expected to reach nearly 2.1 billion dollars by the end of 2025. O mercado como a China abrir as, as fronteiras para para consumir esse produto, nós estamos aument vamos aumentar. Acai's popularity took off in other Brazilian states in the 1980s when it became part of workout culture in Rio and Sao Paulo. The Bulls made regular appearances in this popular 90s soap opera that took place at a gym. Its high calorie content made it a perfect pre or post exercise food, and its antioxidants made it easy to brand a superfood. 
that came with claims that it can solve all sorts of health issues like obesity, type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, strokes, hypertension, high risk for COVID-19, cognitive difficulties, sexual difficulties. But nutritionists say this narrative has been blown out of proportion. Wait a minute. One food can't do that, can it? No, of course not. Nonetheless, Americans were hooked and made all kinds of acai bowls, mixing in fruit, granola, honey, and more. But it's a far cry from the culture of the people who have eaten it for much longer. Indigenous people living in the Amazon have harvested and consumed acai for centuries, maybe even millennia. And it's still a staple food in the daily diet of people in Pará, who eat it fresh with savory meals. Lucas was 12 when he started climbing acai trees, and he still does, 36 years later. I took it for my consumption, to help my father. So I thought that he didn't have the condition to me bank. Comecei a apanhar o açaí, né, para me manter, para minha roupa, era sorteio, meus calços, sapatos. In recent years, açaí has also made headlines in American and Brazilian media for reports of children working in the industry. But farmers like Lucas say it's always been this way, and that it's normal for everyone in the family to help out and learn the trade. É uma cultura porque vai passando de pai para filho, de avô para Nowadays, Lucas owns this land along with 55 other families. These kinds of settlements are called quilombos, or a quilombola community, and many go back centuries. They were established by enslaved Africans and Afro-descendants who ran away into the jungle and started communities like this to survive. Many learn from indigenous people how to harvest and process native foods, including acai. The Brazilian government estimates there are nearly 6,000 quilombola communities in the country. And a 2013 study found roughly 75% still lived in extreme poverty. Mas é uma uma comunidade rica, né? A gente se diz assim pobre, mas se torna rico, né, de espírito. Lucas's acai trees grow alongside different native trees and plants. But larger monoculture plantations that produce more fruit are on the rise. The amount of land used for these plantations has more than tripled since 2006. These plantations are often located far away from floodplains where acai trees naturally thrive. That means big producers have to irrigate their acai trees, while farmers like Lucas rely on natural seasonal flooding from the nearby river. Isso sem falar no problema da biodiversidade por inteiro, né? Se você, enfim, transforma a Amazônia em plantios. Some small producers have also been favoring acai trees over others, which could become an issue in the long run. And experts worry that as acai's popularity continues to grow, the cultural traditions of Pará and the Amazon could be lost. Tendendo a transformar o acai em uma commodity. Isso é ruim. Aí tudo depende da escala, porque, né? Enfim, não interessa. A qualidade é pouco, mas tem qualidade. Não é isso que interessa. Açaí is something Lucas and many people here take pride in. Esse aqui é o processo do nosso açaí para o nosso consumo local. A gente bota um pouquinho de farinha aqui dentro, né, do açaí. E aqui um pedacinho dele aqui, um pouco do feijão, um pouco do arroz. Aqui. Aí um pouquinho do açaí. Então experimente como nós, para vocês sentirem o sabor do nosso açaí paraense. O açaí normal, puro. E vocês vão ver a delícia que é o nosso açaí. Obrigado.